Good morning, Caroline. How are you guys doing this morning? Good morning, Ron. That's good. I like the answer. We're great. It is hoodie weather for sure. I got my hoodie on. I can't. All right. I'm going to get started in about a minute or two. Give some more people a chance to get on. the weather to be a, a little bit too fast hoodie weather like I like hoodie weather when it's like upper 60s at nighttime is cool or like 70s and it's cool but it's been pretty chilly this last week so um, I'm ready for fall not ready for winter and I'm not ready for late fall weather yet like I want early fall weather which we skipped so uh, maybe we'll, maybe we'll get it later this week and moving forward um, good I'm gonna turn this down. Get ready to get started here. All right, so you guys having a good morning then it looks like. Whoa, don't wanna do that. My technology's acting weird this morning. Or maybe it's just me not knowing how to handle my technology. All right. So we're going to get ready to get started here. I'm going to open in prayer. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4 today. Um, and then we'll have our time of prayer. And there's a lot to pray for today. And I don't know if, um, I think probably everybody, because, you know, we all in Michigan moved to Florida when we retired. So we probably all know somebody in Florida or somebody close to the golf. We have a lot of friends and family um, in Florida, and many that live right in the area that's getting hit hard. Um, so we're praying for them this morning and, and, and for other things as well. So I'm going to get into, good morning, yup, must be referring to the weather. So we're going to get into Ephesians chapter 4. I'm going to start with um, verse 1 since I'm done praying. So Lord, we thank you for it this morning. We thank you for your word. We pray that we would uh, uh, just have an incredible time this morning of just going through your word and that you would, be, that you would teach us, that you'd give us ears to hear what you were saying. Um, in the word here this morning, that we would um, have, the, have the desire, the will, or the, the heart to receive it. Um, but also the will to do it, Lord, that we would accomplish your word um, every single day when we live, Lord, that we would honor you with the way that we live, um, which is exactly what Ephesians 4 is talking about. So help us to learn that lesson today um, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to start here in Ephesians chapter 4. Um, I really like the way it starts off. It's almost it's like when you read the rest of Ephesians 4 after the beginning, it, it's really neat. Um, just a connection of the, of the two parts. So start off with, therefore I... The prisoner of the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling in which you have been called. And by the way, we're all called. So he's talking to the church in Ephesus, not just to church leaders. Um, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, being diligent to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So he starts off the whole letter by just saying, listen, you need to walk in a manner that's worthy of the calling in which you've been called. Walk in humility and gentleness with patience, bearing one another. Because you know, sometimes when we're working with each other, um, you, know, you know how it is, you all work with people sometimes. And when you work with people, sometimes you, uh, they make, sometimes somebody makes it hard on you to be patient, right? Anybody experienced that before? Or somebody you're working with makes it hard for you to be patient, hard for you to be gentle, hard for you to remain humble, um, and handle things in a way that brings peace. And I think that's what this passage is saying is that, um, that there's a way that we handle things that to be diligent and making sure there's unity within the church 
that requires me to remain humble so that I handle situations in gentleness and patience. So that because I'm dealing with people and people who are part of the kingdom. And that's what Paul's addressing. He's talking to the church in Ephesus regarding uh, important things. And so he starts it off by saying, hey, walk in a manner. Why would he say that to the church? Because it's likely that some are not walking in a manner worthy of the calling. And uh, so he's addressing that. And so if we go to verse number four. There is one body and one spirit, just as you also were called in one hope, in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captive the captives and he gave gifts to people. Now this expression, he ascended, what does it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens so that he might fill all things. And, his, and he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the, for the work of of ministry for the building up of the body of Christ. I'm going to stop just for a minute there because what we see in this passage, he's talking about first, he's kind of just making and declaring that Jesus fills all things. He's in charge of everything. He owns it all. He's in charge of it all. But then it goes on to a gift that he has given to us, the church, and that is apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, the fivefold ministry, as we would call it. Um, there are movements today. There's a lot of them actually um, happening different things that are going on within the body of Christ. If you know the name Francis Chan, he started a home church movement. Um, he just really felt like, and I felt like his intentions were pure. Um, it, he felt like the church has got has gotten so big. You know, he's a, a church of a pastor of a mega church and had gotten so big and so flashy and so um, performance driven that he, he just felt broken. He felt like he wasn't there. They weren't doing really what they needed to do for the Lord. And so he, um, his focus changed to doing home churches, and he starts this whole tr home church movement, and they're and they're growing, and they're, and they're really um, well modeled in a sense that um, most home home churches don't have a lot of evangelism. It's just a lot of people who are believers who come together, and you know you don't see them grow outside of the homes uh, unless it's like a birth church. Like they admit, hey, this is a church. We're starting a church. The idea is we're at our home because we don't have money for a place, but we're going to grow. We're going to invite people, and eventually they get to a school or get to somewhere else, and they grow. Um, but there's different kinds of church home movements. And this one specifically, um, for Francis Chan, their, their main mission is we want to evangelize. We want to, but discipleship and, and relationship are the main things. So their home group, their, their home churches that they, they have allow for a lot of, a lot of that, a lot of, uh, discipleship, a lot of relationship because you don't have a lot of people in a home. You have five to 10 people, five to 15 people at the most in a home. And then when, it, when they start growing to a point while well, they're training other leaders, so then they start another home church, uh, homes, home, yeah, call it a home church. Um, and they'll just continue to grow. Evangelism doesn't stop. It just becomes more and more home churches that people get saved. Um, and that's good. It's a good thing. I think that we accomplish that by doing our home groups and we want to be able to do, um, there's some things that I think probably in the future we'll do differently with our home groups and do better to make sure we accomplish some of these things. Um, but there's other church movements, home, home church movements, where um, they're birthed out of the, the hurt and bitterness that came from church hurt. Like they received, they had church hurt, they had pe people in leadership who were um, not living right, not having the right heart or right attitudes, at least it's perceived that way. And, um, and they're birth out of this. And some of these movements have been talking about how they, the hierarchy within the church, like the, the hierarchy of leadership is not biblical and you can't have these people who are ruling and, and they're, they're all a bunch of, and these, these are words I've heard, um, they're arrogant or that they are, um, all these church leaders are um, uh, what's nar narcissists and things of that nature. You hear that, I've heard that on multiple occasions from different um, people who are leading these home groups. Um, specifically when I was in Minnesota, there was a situation where that, that was a conversation that was had. They're all, all pastors, they're all narcissist leaders trying to control everybody. And so what they fail to realize is that it's not really a hierarchy. When God gave us apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and, evan pastors and teachers, um, there are people who work with the church Yes, they oversee. They literally are scripturally. They're overseas. They're shepherds. They're all these different things. Um, but they're not controlling. They're leading. There's a difference between controlling and leading. 
Um, they're directing, they're teaching, they're equipping saints for service. When you say that they're all, every one of them are all narcissists, you really miss the point that this is, you're, you're really messing with God's order because God is a God of order. And he has this order of, of how the church should operate and who are the ones who are teaching and equipping people. And so it's important to know that no matter what you do, there's going to be um, in the kingdom, if you are serving the Lord, no matter what, there are going to be those who are put in positions of apostle, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. It, it, you can't avoid it. And if you if you do avoid it, you're doing so in disobedience to the Lord. It's not God's plan. God's plan is always to have these people who are equipping the church, shepherding the church, protecting the church, overseeing and making sure, like Paul the apostle, when he writes this letter to Ephesus, he starts off with walk in a manner that's worthy of the calling with which you have been called. And he talks about walking in humility and walking in unity. Paul is addressing the church and he has that authority because he is, a, is an apostle. He has that authority from God to teach this or speak this in his letter. And there's accountability comes with it. There is, there's gotta be some, some level of we're all looking out for each other or all making sure that our hearts are right before the Lord. But there is there are those that the Lord put in place for that. So it's important that we don't get confused and don't get lost um, we get church hurt, and sometimes without dealing with it, you get bitterness. And then if you get bitterness, a lot of things happen, um, and you end up being out of order. And you really got to deal with that bitterness and get the heart right, because God's structure is a good structure, because it's God's structure. And so it's not a bad thing. It's an important thing. I actually love the idea of, I feel like every church should have all five of these within their body. Um, if you have an apostle, some prophets, and evangelists, and pastors, and teachers within your church, it's healthy because they're all working together and they're accountable to one another. And there's no, and I think, I think that we have that with elders and things like that to where you have that accountability and structure. So you don't have one person who is ruling. Um, there are CEO models nowadays where you have one person who's ruling the entire thing and it's a business more than it is a church. But um, we don't want that, but we want a model that you have these people working together who are in these leadership roles who are helping to build and equip the church for service. It's a good thing. So go to verse number 13. Um, or the reason why he's given us all of these people um, is for building up the body of Christ. And then verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature, which belongs to the fullness, to, to the fullness of Christ. As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried out by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of people, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. So this is important because when you have those, those these, these, these that some people call it a hierarchy, I will call it those who are leading and directing and shepherding and covering and protecting the church. Um, when they're in those roles, they're teaching you, they're helping you to grow, they're giving you opportunities to use your gifts. And then through those different things and you're serving and you're learning and you're growing and you're maturing and you're walking in a way that is, is worthy of the calling which you have and you are walking in humility, you begin to mature and grow. And when you are in that position where you're maturing and growing, you know the word well, you know the Lord well, you've walked with accountability and with people who love you and care about you, that maturity that you gain is what allows you. Now, the maturity is kind of crazy because you're walking in maturity, but maturity without pride, maturity with humility. Real real maturity is in Christ is walking in imitation of Christ. We see that in Philippians chapter 2, like in this passage, just talking about growing up, maturing in the faith. Philippians chapter 2 talks about how do we do that? And that is that we imitate Christ, that we become imitators of Christ. And so we have that growth and that maturity that then puts us in position to understand things that are happening around us. And then we can recognize these different doctrines and teachings, like the one I just mentioned a minute ago, where people are like, there should be no hierarchy. There should be there. Uh, it's, they have it all wrong. And it's because of the things that they've allowed in their lives that they, they believe they're mature, but they're not because they're not accepting or receiving the full word of God. They're changing things um, and trying to create their own order and structure. So that maturity that we have is what allows us to avoid the trickery, uh, the trickery of people by craftiness and deceitful scheming. Now think about that. Remember, um, if you were there Sunday, I was talking about marriage, but I think this is a, a factual thing for all of us. Matter of fact, when I talked about the Adam and Eve relationship, I talked about um, the what was the what, what were the things that caused Eve to. Take, take that fruit and eat of it, even though she was told not to. 
The Bible literally says that she had um, she had saw that it was good for food. Um, she saw that it was pleasant to the eye, and she saw that it would make her wise. And then I shared a scripture um, that I think explains that, and that is First John uh, chapter two verse sixteen. It says, "For all that is in the world is the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life." is not from the Father, but it is from the world. And these are the things, um, those three Those three ways are the ways that God, that God, but the enemy will always attack you and me. The same way he approached Eve. He approached Eve with that same mentality. He, he showed her this fruit is good to eat. That was the lust of the flesh. He showed her that it was pleasant to the eye, the lust of the eyes. And he showed her that it can make her wise and be like God, which was the boastful pride of life. And so he attacks all of these things. He attacks the knowledge of God that we have, and, and so we have to be mature in the faith and grow in the faith, which then requires that we walk in a way that is, that is um, worthy of our calling, but we also walk in humility and in peace with each other, not battling, not fighting, but we're growing up and maturing. And we honor the fact that, that we have those over covering us who are teaching and, and, and doing all these things to equip us and train us and prepare us, right? Because they're helping us get in position where we can handle when the enemy brings the lust of the flesh or the lust of the eyes or the boastful pride of life. And so he's addressing the church saying, hey, you got to be careful because there's craftiness that is coming. There is deceitful scheming that is coming. And yes, most of the time it's going to come through people, but don't be missled, right? Don't be deceived. The enemy is directing that, right? The enemy is directing that. Um, people are not the enemy, right? We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and rulers. Um, and so we are not really wrestling against the people who bring deceitfulness. We're wrestling against the enemy who deceived them to get them to come to the point where they would try to bring trickery. You know, people get hurt and they get wounded. The enemy causes that. Then the enemy gets into the middle of that wound and doesn't let it heal, but he just goes at it, goes at it to the point where it's infected and it becomes bitterness. And when a person begins to walk in bitterness or walk in a way where that person's wrong and I'm right and there's no humility now, there's pride rising up. That is the pride of life, right? So the enemy uses that and he causes a lot of problems. Recently, there is um, a really, really well-known worship leader right now, actually, who had social media has a way of exposing things and some things were exposed person was really, really wasted on a tour bus with a, a secular musician who's really messed up, uh, to be honest. And there's a lot of things happening in this video that were inappropriate, really wrong. And so the, um, you know, this person was, everybody who was around him has been saying, he's very gen genuine, very sincere. We know him personally. He really loved the Lord. And so does, he just happened to have just a woman going through a rough time. Well, uh, this is an example, and I want to share this. is important because what we've done in the church is we have treated certain areas of ministry like they're idols. We're not maturing because we're stuck on certain things. Um, worship is a good example of that. Worship is a great example of that. Worship was never meant um, to be for people. It was meant to be to the Lord only, to honor him, to lift him up, to exalt him, to recognize his goodness and his greatness. But we have we have created a worship. We have caused worship to become an idol in the church to where worship now is like we we, we like the way the music sounds. We like the, the way the person sings. We like the way they play their instruments in the worship. We're buying the worship albums and we run to the concerts and fill stadiums. And we're not really filling stadiums at a worship concert to encounter the Lord. We want to be in the room with people, right? We want to be in the same room as people like, um, uh, you know, Chris Tomlin or or Maverick City or, you know, all these different people or Jesus culture. We want to be in the same room because they're such amazing worship leaders and this, that, and the other. We have turned those who are supposed to bring bended knee and surrender before the Lord, because that's what you do as worship leaders. Um, and we have now lifted them up in a high place. So they have now become superstars in the church. They're not just superstars. Like literally if a, a, a big time worship people come to the area here and, and they, they'll fill a stadium with people who are going to watch them. Um, and at the same time, we do that at some of our churches, local churches. Sometimes we're paying people to be on our worship teams. Now I'm talking about instrument players, drummers, whatever. Um, we were at a church in Minnesota finding out that half their worship team, actually all but one, the, the lead singer, everybody else wasn't even saved. And they're going out back after worship service and smoking and doing all that kind of stuff. And, you know, being ridiculous, actually some absurd things and conversations they were having. Um, they, the, we have gotten to a point with worship that it is an idol to where we have to be excellent, so excellent that we don't care about the standard anymore. We don't care about living in a way that's worthy of our calling anymore, right? So we now we can put anybody in these positions because it's all about we want 
the people who are walking into our buildings to love our worship so much. And that's all that matters. We don't care that they're encountering Jesus. We just care that they, they love the worship because then they come back and then they bring friends and then we turn into a mega church and all these kind of things happen. So it is important to understand that, that, that the enemy comes in and, and he deceives and he gets us to start walking in a, in a way that where the pride of life comes in, right? The pride of life is there and people begin to get up in this place. And even if you're a worship leader and you started with all the right intentions, as soon as you become a superstar and everybody loves you and you become popular and now you're getting on all the award shows and all these different kind of things, you become very susceptible. And I, I love the way he worked this, this specific guy who had his falling fallout. Um, the people he worked with had put out a statement saying that um, they are no longer working with him. Um, it's on a pause right now as far as a relationship with this worship leader. But he is a brother in Christ, so they're going to spend time, you know, hopefully working with him. And um, and they admitted it, the, the, these behaviors were not fit for their ministry or for the kingdom. But at the same time, he is still a brother in Christ. So they're going to work with him. I think that's important. Because they handle it the way the kingdom should handle it. Like when we do have somebody who rises up in pride or somebody who falls into any of these categories and they fall into sin, the Bible says that we should um, gently restore them. So we don't throw them out, but we gently restore them. But it's so important that even as the body of Christ as church, as we try to figure out new ways to reach people, and, and worship we, worship is a big part of that, but it's important that your worship, like we're currently looking for a worship leader, and I'm, I'm, people are asking, what are you looking for? I, I'm being straightforward and honest. We want somebody who's gifted, and, but I want somebody who's called and anointed more than anything else. I'm looking for something similar to when David played the harp, and, and, and the spirit and, and Saul's spirit was sued. The spirits that were tormenting him left because of that anointing that was on that heart plane. Um, that's what we're looking for, a real worship, real surrender to the Lord, uh, where people really have encounters with Jesus, nothing more, nothing less. We don't want anything other than that. Um, yeah, we want it to sound good because, you know, it's good for the ears to hear really awesome sound. People give that, God gives people those gifts for that reason. It's pleasant to us, but at the same time, the purpose is not for that person to become great. The purpose is that we see the Lord in a greater way, and that's the important thing. So there is there is an important thing. So anyway, the bottom line is that there's craftiness and deceitfulness that comes um, often from within the church, and then we can fall into those traps. And so Paul's addressing this. And so then he says in verse 15, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects, all aspects into him who is the head, that is Christ, from who the whole body being fitted and held together by what whatever joints, whatever, um, but what every joint supplies. In other words, all of us are a part of holding this body together. According to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of, of itself in love. So I say this and affirm in the Lord that you are to, to no longer walk just as the Gentiles also walked in futility of their minds, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of ignorance that is in them because of the hardness of their heart. And they have, having become callous, have given themselves up to indecent behavior for practices for every kind of impurity with greediness, but you did not learn Christ in this way. I'm going to stop right there. So Paul's talking about you're not going to walk in the same way that Gentiles walk. And he goes on and on about how they're darkened and their hearts are hard and they're giving themselves to all kinds of sin. But he this key sentences in here. But you did not learn Christ in this way. I am um, here is the issue, and I think Paul has been writing these letters to all these churches. And, he, and he, we, this last Sunday, we talked about the church in Corinth and how messed up Corinth was. We also talked about how Corinth was a very wicked place and so much so that that wickedness began to infiltrate the church. And these were you know, mostly a Gentile church. And a lot of the Gentile ways, a lot of the ways that they lived became a part of the church. Sexual morality and all these things started becoming a part of that church. And I believe Paul's addressing the church regarding the church. Like you're not, you did not learn Christ in this way to where you can continue in these behaviors or have these behaviors. So it's important to understand he's not just saying you, you can't just act like the world. What he's saying is you can't act like the world and you can't act like the church that acts like the world. You have to, you can't conform to the patterns of this world. And many of the church has conformed to the patterns of this world. You need to not do this is really what's happening in this passage. You did not, I love that phrase, but you did not learn Christ in this way. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to the former way of life, you are to rid yourselves of the old self, 
which is being corrupted currently, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. And we, we just talked about the three areas, right? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and what is the last one? The pride of life. And here he goes talking about it again, yeah, which is being corrupted by the in, accord, in accordance with the lust of deceit. And that you are being renewed in the spirit of your minds. And to put on the new self, which is the likeness of God, which is the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Therefore, ridding yourself of falsehood, speak truth to one another. Uh, speak, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, because we are a part of one another. Be angry, yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. In other words, deal with it. And do not give the devil an opportunity. I think this is really important because remember earlier I talked about those who have had experienced church or anger um, issues that turned into bitterness that caused them to separate themselves from the church. And then they start going off in these weird belief systems because now there's no accountability or anything, no covering. Um, this pastor right here say, hey, you can be angry, but you have to, but don't let the sun go down on you. You can be angry, but do not sin. In other words, don't act on it in a, in a negative way. Um, then he says, do not let something go on in your anger, which means you need to deal with it and get rid of it. You need to deal with it because if you don't, you're going to give the devil an opportunity and the opportunity is going to be for him to come in and manipulate and deceive and trick. So we can't allow that to happen. Um, the one who steals must no longer steal, but rather he must labor producing with his own hands what is good so that the will of will so that he will have something to share with one who has need. Let the let no unwholesome word come out of your mouth, but if there is any good word for edification according to the need of the moment, say that, so that it will give grace to those who hear. In other words, watch what you say. Make sure that what you're going to say in any moment is a word that's going to bring um, life and encouragement um, and not destruction or not shame, right? And then he ends this. This is important, and this is where I want to end it today um, because, of course, this is the end of the chapter. Do not grieve... The, the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Remember, I talked about that a while back, what sealing is in that script, in scriptural times, biblical times. Um, when somebody had a slave, they had owned slaves, they actually branded them with their family seal, and that would show that they were owned by them. And so it's the same um, thing we're seeing here, is that when somebody gives their life to Christ, they're sealed. Their branding shows that they belong to Christ, that you were purchased by the blood of Christ. And so that's what he's saying. So don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So the Holy Spirit being in us is the evidence that we belong to Jesus and that we have been branded and now we're in, our, in his life. But all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and slander must be removed from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, compassionate, forgiving each other, just as in just as in Christ or just as Christ, or just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. In other words, when you allow bitterness in, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, and all these things, when you're not kind to one another, when you're not compassionate, when you're not forgiving, when you any of those kind of things, you grieve the Holy Spirit. So he's saying, don't do this. Live in a way that is worthy of the calling in which you were called. Walk humbly. I think humility is such an important word in this in this um, chapter here because I think what we're really learning is that when you learn to walk in humility rather than pride, when you walk in humility, you're willing to forgive. When you walk in humility, you recognize that, that people are, are are broken. And so sometimes somebody's going to say something to you or, or hurt you in some way. So you don't need to be bitter because you understand these things and you're also able and capable of doing those things. So we, we got to be careful with that. And so there's things we can learn. Humility, I think, is the biggest weapon we have against the lust of the flesh, the lust of our, the eyes, and the pride of life. When you walk in humility before the Lord, you recognize you're broken, that you're not, that the Lord is in the process of making, you know, you, yeah, you saved you, and yeah, he's, uh, you're, you're redeemed and all of those kind of good things, but you're still in the process of sanctification, of being set apart. You're still working on you, and so you're not perfect. And if you walk in that mindset, I'm not perfect. I'm, I'm, the Lord is great. The Lord is amazing. He's worthy of, to be worshipped. He's worthy to be exalted. Um, I'm just going to serve and honor the Lord in the best way I can. And when that, that way, when people come and do things or hurt things, when deception starts coming in, um, the Lord is always at the forefront because you recognize your need for him, right? So that's it for today. Hopefully um, 
you enjoyed it. Um, get, you can give comments in the chat like always. I, I, I told you before, I, I think I said this every, almost every single time I've been doing it since I started this last last year, um, doing, this, doing this online thing. But um, feel free to jump in anytime we're having these conversations. Jump in and share your thoughts, your opinions. Um, if you have something to add, add it um, when we're having these discussions because it's important that we have just the, uh, I want dialogue and this as much as possible. So, um, but let's go into a time of prayer. And, and first I, I feel like the need when I read something like this today, I read these passages um, that we pray first regarding that, that Lord will help us to remain humble, help us to walk in a manner that is worthy. We can't do that on our own. Unfortunately, it's just really hard to do, um, but we need to be diligent in unity of the spirit and, a, and have peace with the church and with each other, praying for those who have fallen and in sin and fallen in, 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 into deception. So let's pray for that as well. So Lord, right now, we just thank you for your presence. We thank you for your word today. We thank you that um, you are with us and that you never leave us nor forsake us. And even though we are broken people who um, you are repairing daily and you are bringing us closer and closer to being imitators of you the way that we should, we want to walk in a way that is worthy of the calling which you've called us. And we want to walk in a way um, that is humble and broken and contrite before you. So we pray today in Jesus' name that you'd help us to do that, Lord, that you would continue to, to reveal to us our desperate need for you, that, that we cannot do this on our own, that we need you, that when you give us gifts, it's not, your word says that our gifts are, are will make room for us, but it, you're but it doesn't say that your gifts will build us up and exalt us and make the world love us, and that's a good thing. Lord, they, they give us opportunities to glorify you. So when our, when your gifts make room to, for us, it's because you give us opportunities to honor you and to glorify you with those gifts. And so we pray that that would be the case in our lives. We pray that would be the case in all of the lives of everybody who's a believer, Lord. Today, I pray that we would learn not to exalt and lift up um, people who are doing the things that we love like music or, or sports or whatever it might be but lord that we would that we treat them the same way we treat the next person next to us in church with love and kindness and compassion um, and not making them something that they're not lord and that is that they're so amazing so awesome we're none of us are you are lord you are awesome you are amazing we're just servants um, bond servants as paul would say um, and so we just want to be that way and live that way before you lord um, we're praying right now just for a, a, a move of your spirit within your church, a move that, that heals all bitterness and, and anger and frustration and a resentment, Lord, a movement that unites and brings peace and a movement that leads to salvation of thousands of people, millions of people, Lord, um, that it would not be about our thoughts, our opinions, our ways, but it'd be about your kingdom being built, Lord. We pray by the power of the Holy Spirit that you would move in the church in America and worldwide. Um, there's nothing great that's going to happen in our politics. There's nothing great that's going to happen in anything that we have going on in the world if your church is not empowered and filled with your spirit and moving in the right direction in a unified way. So we're praying right now for that outpouring of your spirit within your church and that there would be a revival that would take place, an awakening that would take place, and that there would be signs and wonders and miracles and that everybody would recognize you're the one who's doing those things that we take our eyes off worship teams and uh, put our eyes on you, that when they lead, it will not be about their gift, but it will be about their gift presenting um, you before us, Lord. And that would be what we ask today in Jesus' name. We pray just for that fresh outpouring of your spirit today. Um, we need uh, we need you in America. We need you in the world, Lord. And in order for that to happen, the church being weakened is the reason why some of these other things have been weakened. And so strengthen your church, build your church, give us authority and power and giftedness, help us to walk um, and do everything that you've called us to do, but in, do it in humility. Um, and that you would then put the right people in the right positions, Lord, of government. Lord, we've got elections coming up. We've got things like that are coming. We're praying that you put the right people in place um, according to your will that you would have your way. Um, we're praying uh, more important than our politics, more important than anything else, Lord, we're praying for that revival that takes place that would lead to just thousands and millions of people surrendering their lives to you, recognizing. Um, and I pray that the world's view, because the world's view right now is that they're they're rejecting the church. They're not necessarily rejecting you. Uh, and we've kind of earned that. But Lord, we pray in Jesus' name that you'd help us to start living in that worthy way that would be a blessing and that many would come to know you today, Jesus. We ask for revival for our poor. We're praying right now for... Um, Oh, 
We're praying. We pray for Florida right now, Lord. A lot of us have friends and family and and people that we love there, and so we're praying in Jesus' name that you would touch them today, uh, protect them. Uh, we're praying right now that even as the storm hits the coast, that you would cause it to dissipate and weaken. And we're praying as it dissipates and weakens, that it would spare so many lives. We're praying that that lives and properties and stuff like that would be protected today in Jesus' name. Uh, we're just praying that you would. Um, just have your way in that situation that lives would be spared and it, it, pray that the churches can rise up in this time down there and have an effective way of helping and serving people. And we're just pray, praying right now. I pray for our friends who are there and for all that we know. Lord, in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray for the wedding family. And read these, sorry. I skipped that, okay. Lord, we pray right now for a young woman struggling with emotional and mental problems. We pray right now in Jesus' name that you would, first of all, heal those wounds. Those There's wounds that are there. That's the reason why there's a struggle. So we're praying right now for emotional healing, mental healing, Lord, that you would help help her to have the right mind as she surrenders her life to you that you would have that she would then have the mind of Christ that would put her in the right mind in the right mental place in Jesus name that you would just touch her right now I pray right first of all for her salvation praying for the wedding family and and um, don't really know what's going on there but we pray right now Lord Jesus that you would move in that situation and that you would move um, in their life right now Lord Jesus we thank you We pray right now for those who maybe we've been involved in, um, that maybe those who've been wounded by the sin that we commit as the church. Uh, we just pray in Jesus' name that as we ask for forgiveness from you um, and from them, that there would be a healing that would come. And it, that sometimes when we do things that are sinful, and then we recognize it and repent from it and then ask for forgiveness, even from the people who we did that against, that it shows your character even more. And maybe they respond with salvation by giving their life to you, recognizing that we were humble enough to recognize our issues and that, that we were broken and that they did, um, that they could see you in that situation Lord, right now. Can uh, you explain the situation that's going on with Rob? I'm not sure that situation. So maybe you can Post that in there so I can um, pray properly. I don't know. There's a couple situations in here that I'm not familiar with what's going on. So, um, okay, that's now. Now I first names sometimes throw me off, and then I see something, and I, now I can connect dots. Thank you. <laughs> so yeah, Lord, we pray right now for um, the wedding family and everything that's going on in the situation with Rob, and I know that. Um, and they're pulling the tubes and, and there's the decisions that were made here that I know will make it hard for the family. We pray right now in Jesus name that as they deal with this situation and the circumstances and the pain and the hurt of all this, Lord, we pray right now for you to comfort them and that you would bring them peace, that you would strengthen and encourage them. Lord, today in Jesus name, we pray um, that you would be with them, that you would strengthen them and encourage them today, Lord. In Jesus name, we thank you. And, um, and we just continue also, um, and we pray also for Rob in this situation as they get ready to do this. So we still believe in your healing power, even to the last second. So, Lord, we're praying right now for Rob that if it is possible for you to heal completely, it is possible. That if it's your desire, um, we're just praying right now that you would, that you would touch his body right now in Jesus' name and bring healing to him. Um, and, and we just should always, I just believe I should always request that of you because you are the, the last resort, Lord. You are able to do, and there's nothing you cannot do. So we pray for that healing. And um, we, we love you. We appreciate you, Lord. We know that you are able. So um, we're just praying right now for that, that miracle to take place of healing. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Sometimes I, uh, I get the request and I know exactly what it is, and sometimes I don't. Sometimes um, it's, it's better if I have a little bit of explanation, right? So we get a little bit of explanation, then I can then I can do it. And I so the, the, the dots connected and we worked it out and it's all good. 
It's all good. All right. Well, I'm going to let you guys go because you guys have a busy day ahead of you, I'm sure. And um, got uh, Bible studies tonight and uh, all that kind of stuff. So if you have a small group praying that you have an amazing time tonight in that small group. And it, um, again, it's an awesome day. Um, we're praying for you, Jackie, and for the family. And uh, we'll continue to do that as well. Not just now, but continually. Amen. All right. Um, you guys have an amazing day. Be blessed in Jesus' name.